Now, it's being claimed that thousands of children in Britain don't have a bed of their own. The charity Butler UK says many of them are forced to share beds with their siblings or even sleep on the floor because their parents can't afford to buy them separate beds. Buttle says it's provided more than 13,000 beds to children over the last five years and is now written to MPs and councils in the UK's most deprived areas calling for action. Well, it's something we'll be discussing in a moment. But first, BBC Yorkshire's Anna Crossley has met families who have been helped with beds. Delighted with his new bed and duvet, Mikhail now has his own place to sleep thanks to the charity Buttle UK. Since growing out of his cot two years ago, he had been sharing a bed with his mum. I couldn't afford a bed with the money I was getting. Um, Mikhail was um, obviously keeping me up all night, kicking. Um, I was surviving on two hours sleep. So obviously I was getting this poorly with myself. I feeling like I shouldn't be a mum and stuff because my children were going without what they needed. Um, I spent most nights getting upset with myself because mm. even trying to find ways, I'd be sat up six, so like four or five o'clock in the morning trying to find a way around being able to get my kids things. Sarah and Mikhail aren't alone. Oh. Buttle says that over the past five years it's given beds to 13 and a half thousand children and primary school teacher Bex Wilson was so concerned that she set up her own charity to help deal with the problem in Leeds. Hello. She now spends much of her free time delivering me. beds, really duvets and pyjamas to children across the city. She says it started after a conversation with one of her pupils. I said, you know, you f I feel when I'm talking to you that you're really tired as well. Did you not have a good night's sleep last night? And he said, I never have a good night's sleep, I don't have a bed and he showed me some sores on his tummy, he lifted up his school jumper, showed me some sores on his tummy where the bed bugs had been biting him at night um, from sleeping on this cushion on the, on the floor, um, a big cushion that was, it, that was infested. Um, and it was in that moment, I think, where I realised I can refer this, I can do all, I can follow policy and procedure to the letter, but that doesn't mean that this child by the end of this week will have a bed. And ultimately, that's what he needs. Today, Bex and her dad are dropping beds off to three brothers who've been referred by their school. It's a familiar story. Bright children who are too tired to learn. So I've got some things here that are going to help you make sure that you get a good night's sleep, OK? So I've got some pyjamas, OK? And if you look behind you, wow. we've got some brand new beds coming so that each of you have your own bed. It's typical of all RFLs that we have with a lack of furniture and, and things and, you know, children sleeping in rooms and, and spaces like this on the floor, mattress on the floor, makeshift mattress, um, no space, in, space for, um, you know, storage and those kind of things is quite typical. But where are the children here sleeping? So there's, at the moment there's three in here um, and then there's one in with mum in the other room. Tonight, across our towns and cities, thousands of children will go to sleep without a bed of their own. Many will be forced to sleep with siblings and parents. Others will be on floors or sofas. I will never forget the first delivery that we ever did. And stepping into that house, knowing this is something that needs to change, this is not good enough, that children are living in our city with no no beds but no furniture in the house they had one white plastic garden chair that was the furniture in the house nobody can function to the best of their ability when they are tired poverty is a vicious cycle we want to make sure that children can get out of that cycle can break out of that cycle and the way that they do that um, is through education Something as basic as a bed has made a big difference to Sarah's family life. But in reality, it's only alleviated some of her worries. I want my children to do well and stuff, but finances and poverty are stopping that. There's quite a lot of bright children that are living in poverty and can go a long way in life, but poverty is stopping them. It's terrible that in 2018, in our country, in our city, children that are our future, they are our future, are being left with our bed. Not having a good night's sleep, not going to do well at school because they're too tired. It, it's, it's just not okay. 
Well, let's talk now to Olu Alaki from the charity Buttle UK, which hands out beds to children. Also with us is Vanessa Raimondo, who had to share a bed with her daughter for four years because she was in overcrowded temporary accommodation. She now runs a support group called Mums on a Mission. And also with us is Lawrence Guinness. He is from the Childhood Trust and uh, joins us as well. Thank you ever so much for um, coming in. Vanessa, it's so desperately sad. In 2018, we're watching a film about kids not having a bed to sleep in. But that was the reality for you and your daughter. You slept together for four years. Yes, we did. Um, so when she was born, I was living in a hostel, the fire embarking. So that's a studio flat. Um, and as much as they put a cot there, that, that, that don't make a big difference because the child still, you still end up with the child in your bed. And um, after that, I ended up renting properties and the properties was only one bedroom flat. Again, she was sharing the bed with me because I couldn't afford to buy two beds even if I wanted to at the time. The rent is too high when you're in private. Um, so the, um, then I got moved to temporary accommodation in Edmonton and we wasn't just sharing the bed, we were also sharing the toilet with everybody else in the hostel, in a hotel, which that was quite depressing and frustrating for the child because she's only two trying to run around and there's nowhere to run. So. And I mean, even in that film there, talking about sleep, we all know how cranky we can be when we've had a bad night's sleep. Yes. But if you are consistently sleeping badly and your daughter is sleeping badly, how does that affect life in general? Well, I mean, you just don't wake up on time because you're just, you're never on time for anything. And you don't have a good night's sleep, as you as you mentioned earlier. Um, you, your child is, is dependent on you to do everything. They have no sense of responsibility to make a bed or anything like that because they're constantly sleeping with you. So it just it just comes a lack of dependency from the child. They, they're constantly depending on you to do everything, to go toilet. So, yeah. It's, it's Olu, explain to us how you reached this, this figure that you've estimated of the number of children who don't have a bed in this country of their own. What do you care award? Um, grants to children in need, children, children in crisis situations as we've been doing for the last 65 years and we award between 10 and 12,000 grants every single year. We have found that over the last five years we've awarded 13,500 beds um, in our grants figures which is about a third of the total grants that we award there's actually been a bed included in that package. And it's been growing. Last year, we awarded 3,000 um, beds um, to children who didn't have one in the, right across the country. So we've um, extrapolated from the end child poverty um, f um, statistics on um, the number of children in poverty, which is 4.1 million across the country, to estimate that there are around 400,000 children in the UK who don't have a bed of their own to sleep in. And Lawrence, you work with a charity that, that decorates bedrooms, that, that gives beds, that, that helps families, that transforms lives. Explain the difference you see in those lives when you intervene in the way you do. Absolutely. So the Child of Trust, as London's child poverty charity, uh, supports projects all over London. One of the things we do ourselves is a program called Decorate a Child's Life, where we go in, renovate uh, dilapidated, squalid living conditions, where children some, you know, can often be living in abject uh, destitution. That's the only word to describe it. I see some of the pictures there of the changes that you made. We've, uh, this, is, this was a, a room that we did just two weeks ago. Um, we get corporate volunteers to come in, put their overalls on, roll their sleeves up, get the paint brushes. Uh, it's run with a volunteer interior designer who oversees the program. The young girl in those pictures that you've just seen, a uh, 12-year-old girl in year seven, just started secondary school, she's been living in that condition since she was about three. The mother's got quite profound health needs the, that haven't been fully addressed and supported. They're living in, in poverty. They have about 20 pounds a week to meet all their needs, uh, you know, food and stuff. Um, that girl is exceptionally bright. I asked her, I walked into the bus stop the morning that we, we did the project and asked her what her plans were, what she wanted to be um, when she grew up. And she says, I want to be an engineer. 
And I said, whoa, wow. great. <laughs> uh, she says, because I'm always taking things apart to see how they work and putting them back together. She said, but, but then she looked at me and said, but I don't think I can be because my maths is terrible. And this is a girl that's on the verge of being excluded. Every morning she's been waking up in, in filth and squalor. Uh, nobody's been there to support that family. Um, and this girl just needs a break. And we've given her that break. When she came back uh, after we'd finished the room, she just was speechless, literally speechless. Uh, the first thing she said after about just five minutes is, my cheeks hurt so much because I'm so Because <laughs> <laughs> she's been smiling so much. We've now, uh, through a local organization, uh, got her a, a, a numeracy mentor who's going to work with her to improve her maths. Mm -hmm. Where you have children without beds, it's often the, the tip of an iceberg. There's often, often not enough food to go around in the household. Yeah. There's not enough, there's no recreational activities. No children going on holidays. We're running a summer program for some 15,000 kids uh, through our summer give program. 66% uh, of, of the kids who responded to the survey said they wouldn't have enough to eat during the summer holidays if it wasn't for charity to support them. 94% said they wouldn't be going on holiday. So the bed is, is one part, and the sleep, obviously, a critical part of a child's development. And it is outrageous that we, we live in London, cheek by jowl. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors, and we can't see it. Let me put this to you. Um, uh, we've had quite a few comments like this, and I'd be interested, all of you, to respond to it. One here uh, saying, um, children who are bed sharing are now treated as though they are terribly underprivileged. In past times, this situation was commonplace and didn't have a serious effect on mm. our lives. Today's slogan of entitlement is becoming serious. It contributes to a child's sense of inferiority. Ollie, do you want to respond to that? Well, um, the sharing a bed can be part of the joys of childhood. You know, sharing a bed with your with your siblings, um, you know, playing messing around on your parents' beds, that can be wonderful, as long as you have a choice, you know, to go back to your own bed at the end of it. You know, when they're kicking in the face at night or something, just get out of bed and go to your own bed. What we're talking about here are children who do not have a choice and parents who cannot afford to provide them with that choice. We're talking about children who, um, three, four of them are sleeping in a bed because that's the only bed that there is, or as Vanessa's been talking about, sharing with their parents, or sleeping on the floor, or sleeping on a mattress, or for older children, younger adults, sofa surfing across different houses, you know, just to enable them to get a good night's kip. So it's about choice, um, really, and it's all down to poverty. Vanessa, you wanted to make a point. Um, so when, when is not a, is not fun anymore. It's not nice when your younger sibling is weeing on a bed and you have to share the bed with her. You're a teenager. You're going to school, you know, and you, you're going to be grumpy, or you're sharing. You, you got bed bugs in in the bed, and you know there's nothing that can be done because your mom can't afford to do a, you know to get a pest control over, and the council is not really on time with those things because it's not your, your rent might not be paid on time, so. Or if you're in private renting, the landlord does not leave you to it. It's it not. It's not acceptable. It's not nice for the, that child. They're going to go to school and going to be grumpy, and it's going to affect their everything else they do throughout the day because they already woke up in a bad mood. Well, let's talk about school because I want to bring in Andrea, who is with us now. Andrea Bradley, who is Assistant Secretary at the Educational Institute of Scotland, joining us now from Glasgow. Uh, thank you for your time today, Andrea. Hello. We're picking up there on the impact bed sharing has on setting up the day for young children. We saw in the film we played a little bit earlier on about the challenges when kids go to school when they're tired. Just explain to us what you've seen. Well, our, our members have reported to us, um, it, you know, fr from the findings of a, re a recent survey, um, that um, they have seen around about a 60% increase in the incidence of children coming to school, um, you know, with visible signs of, of, of um, living in poverty. And one of the things that they've told us is that they've seen increased incidence in the number of children who appear um, physically unwell, so, there, so um, 50, in, in excess of 50% of respondents um, indicated to us that kids were coming to school lethargic, pale, uh, with headaches, um, you know, just, just general ailments that they thought were direct, directly attributable to poverty. Um, our members have also reported from, you know, just from, from discussions that they've had with families, um, maybe discussions with homeschool link workers, that they're aware that lots of houses um, in which, you know, the families are living in poverty, they don't have furniture, they don't 
don't have carpets, they don't have washing machines. So we didn't get any information that was specifically about lack of beds, but this information that's been supplied by Buttle UK um, is very, very helpful to us in you know providing further information just about the you know the, the, the reality of, of what it's like for, for children and families who don't have the income to stretch to um, you know the supply of a, a bed for, for each child in the house. Um, and obviously health and wellbeing is absolutely linked to kids' ability to um, yeah. to engage in school, to enjoy school and to benefit from all the opportunities that are you know that are provided to children on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sleep is absolutely absolutely essential to that. Of course. Andrew, thank you so much for speaking to us and thank you also as well for coming in and speaking to us. Thank you.